Welcome everybody. Isn't it fun to have like a experience IT here in New Mexico? I'm really excited about it. Um, OpenMake Software uh, was a company out of Chicago. Um, we made uh, we made the decision to move it to New Mexico January 1st of this year. So we're very happy to be part of this community, and I'm very happy to be asked to be speaking today at this event. So that's me. So we're going to talk about the. Uh, Agile practices, and my screen really doesn't look like that. That's the, <laughs> I didn't really do that. The wavy thing, I was, <laughs> it was a little weird. So we're gonna start, of course, you, you probably wonder why I would start an Agile talk with a bunch of old guys pointing at a whiteboard, which is what those pictures are, instead of some hot chick doing some yoga pose. <laughs> but this is where Agile really started, in this thing that they called the Agile Manifesto. How many of you have read this? Okay, some of you have. It's worth reading, and today we're gonna to go over some, some topics on it. I'm not gonna go through everything, I'm gonna go through the ones that I feel are the most critical and the ones that most people struggle with. So, but the first thing that the Agile Manifesto talks about is the ability to deliver software through early and continuous delivery. For some reason it's not fitting on the screen, but that's what that should say, through early and continuous delivery. The second thing we're gonna talk about is how to deliver working software frequently, which is another main part of the Agile Manifesto is how do you do iterative deployments? How many of you are Jenkins users? We've got two, three, four, we do have a Jenkins meetup, and we do have a really cool Jenkins uh, logo for Albuquerque now, just so you know. The third thing is how to allow developers to do more work and trust them to get the job done. That is probably the, one of the primary problems that I see when we go out and talk to companies uh, in the, the Agile space. And then what's something that um, we don't talk about very much in this Agile manifesto is the maximi maximizing on the work not done the work not done. And at regular intervals, the team needs to reflect and continuously improve. So if we kind of put this together in one nice concept, we can say, through early and continuous delivery, working software is frequently delivered to customers, sort of the basic understanding of Agile. And the three things we're gonna focus on is how to maximize on the work not done through automation, provide continuous feedback loops at regular intervals for that continuous uh, uh, improvement, and trusting developers to get the job done. Those are the three bullet points that I would tell you to take home to your development shops and say these are the areas that we need to focus. Because that's really what is breaking the, the, the agile barriers. Okay, so let's, let's start at the very beginning here. Start at where how we got to, how companies begun to adapt, to, uh, to adopt Agile. Most companies, the first thing that they did was they decided to do Agile, they started to, they started to do their daily stand-ups, and they just realized that continuous build was a real core part of the Agile practice. Um, most, of, most people use Jenkins, there's products like Bamboo and, and Team City, but the whole idea was around continuous build. Now, I just got done talking to somebody who's a build uh, <laughs> expert, and that is really the core of where Agile started, is how do you improve the build? And when we, they were talking about build back then, it's about compiling and linking code. How do you have a build that you can fix in less than 10 minutes? That's the beginning where most people started with Agile. If you, how, how many of you are right now, like, are you working on a project, programmers? programmers. And out of that, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you can fix your build in less than 10 minutes. Okay, so some of you have achieved that kind of first step in, in the Agile practice. So, the second thing that we started doing was, well, okay, we got this build process that's kind of cooking pretty good. We need to do a better job of integrating code on a daily basis. So that's what continuous integration re reflects. The ability to say, I'm going to uh, make a change and I'm gonna kick off a compile. 
So there's these weird, you know, the, this industry, I just got, just said this, this industry has so many terms and it can be very confusing. Let's think about continuous build though as really being able to run the compile process. Continuous integration is a little bigger. There's more of a workflow. You do more things in it. And you try to do it on a more frequent basis. So the difference between this continuous build and this continuous integration. When continuous build started, people would, were excited to get a monthly build done because they were working in a waterfall practice and they had the luxury of time to tweak things and get that compile to work. And then guess what would happen? Is you'd have branches. So you'd have to go through this code integration phase to try to get your build to compile. And some unsung hero who managed compiles in the build process always got it fixed. But it took them some time. So it was kind of a monthly practice. Continuous integration said, we gotta stop this, this process where the build's executed once a month, and instead, we're going to execute the build on a daily basis, so every time code's checked in, we're going to have a, a quiet period, and at the end of the day, we're gonna compile everything. Most people now compile as soon as a check-in occurs, maybe a quiet period of a minute, and then the build, the build runs. So this has taken us away. We're, I mean, we have, we've, we're, we're doing pretty good in the, in the Agile practice when it comes to the daily stand-ups, coming up with, st with streams, getting our compiles done, integrating the code on a regular basis. Continuous integration started getting testing te teams involved, whereby once that re release candidate was ready to go, let's pass it off to testing so they can start doing a, a more continuous test. So now the term continuous test came up. But what happens in that process? You're jumping from continuous dev, or continuous build and integration, to continuous test. You start almost going back to waterfall in a little bit, right? They're calling it now a pipeline. So what we have is something called a, a, a continuous delivery pipeline. Now, um, this was something I got from CloudBees. Uh, we're CloudBees partners and we did a webinar with them and this was part of the, uh, one of the screens we used in this webinar. And it really talks about what continuous delivery is. And continuous delivery is now becoming a more essential part of the Agile practice, particularly around the ability to do, to do more not doing, uh, to trust developers. Uh, some of those, uh, those items that we're talking about is really what, is what continuous delivery is trying to address. And if you think about what the, how this screen, this, this slide is built out, it starts way down here at development where they're talking about agile, like I was talking about continuous build, continuous integration, an in incremental approach to identifying and changing. Then they, will, they push to continuous integration, the ability, ability to automatically commit and build. Then they talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment. That is something that hasn't really been taken on quite well um, within the industry. Continuous delivery, if I was to give you a definition of the term, this one says software changes continuously delivered to stakeholders in any environment. I would take off in any environment. It's really the ability to have a release candidate at any point at the, in time because continuous delivery is not necessarily deploying any code. Now, if we go all the way to the end where you see the unicorn, the CloudBees folks will even say, continuous deployment is that big unicorn that we really don't do and most companies don't do, we're gonna leave it to companies like OpenEye, who's doing it, <laughs> it has a different uh, architecture, it's not monolithic, and it's, it's done in an AWS environment. So that's how the CloudBees definition is, is continuous deployment is a unicorn. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna break that myth today. So we're really gonna focus on how we can do a better job of the, of the right side of, of this chart. So this transformation's worth it. Um, I've, I also stole this from CloudBees who stole it from Perforce, so I didn't feel too guilty. Uh, <laughs> You know, most people believe that faster time to market is probably the most important reason why you would go to an agile practice. Now, what does that mean? If you're getting it to market, it means it's going to production, right? It's not going to market if it's just sitting at test. Better quality of product, 
Competitive advantage, getting, getting stuff to market faster is really this kind of the same. Higher customer satisfaction, um, reduced cost of, of development. Uh, we were at a, a, a Santa Fe developer meetup that, that Craig back there runs, and he had a guy who's a Kanban expert, and he had us do the funnest project. This, we all were sitting at tables, and we had to pass these pennies around. And first you started with, you had to use your, 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 your not your dominant hand, you had, so I used your left, left hand, you had to pick up a penny and turn it over, and then you had to do them all, and then you passed it to the next person who picked up a penny and turned it over, and then you had to figure out how to do that faster. And the end result was, if you each picked up a penny and passed it and didn't do all 20 pennies at a time, and you, would, you got things to production quicker. And what does that do? That keeps your, your, your customers happy. The whole idea is to get it out to production as fast as possible. So this is sort of what we talk about when we talk about continuous delivery. We talk about a pipeline, things coming down the pipeline, having those pennies move between one person to the next so that the first penny gets to the customer as quick as possible. Not all 25 or 20 fixes have gotten to the customer, but the first, the first fix is at the customer's, on the customer's um, machine or, or in their hands. And some of, the, some of the way that we do that is um, through Jenkins. Jenkins is probably the most. And there, isn't that the cutest little thing? I forgot to bring those. I was going to bring them to hand them out. That was done by Max uh, Arp, Arp Buckle. Huh? I have some left. You have? So we have some. Um, but anyways, so you do Jenkins. You do some code work. You have Eclipse. You've got Microsoft, for the most part, is what companies are, are using in, in, at some level. Um, you have a version control tool. Do you put a, a commit in that process? Jenkins is a continuous integration server. So Jenkins is a work. Everybody know what a job scheduler is? Jenkins is a job scheduler. That's all it is. Um, and it's a job scheduler that was written by a developer at Oracle. And he wrote it so that he could, instead of having somebody read a, a Word doc and say, number one, go check the code out into this directory. Number two, copy these files into this directory. Number three, run the script that I've got sitting in this directory. Number four, copy the files over to this test machine. And number five, email somebody in the test department that says it's ready to test. That's what Jenkins does. It runs those things. And a continuous delivery, what it does is it says, I'm going to run this code, commit, build, package, deploy, test uh, workflow. And when it's good, I am going to tell testing to run their workflow. Now, what we don't see in this is production. And we also see a problem in the build, package, and deploy space. Because in the build, package, and deploy space, what you end up with is scripted solutions. Unlike the testing that uses things like Cucumber and Selenium or even app, uh, um, uh, application monitoring like App Dynamics or reporting, they can use Jira. We talk, we, Craig talked about Jira earlier this morning or Bugzilla and Slack for, for collaboration. All of that stuff is being built underneath the continuous delivery pipeline to speed it up, to maximize on the work not done. And the areas, though, that really struggle is the build, package, and deploy. Now, the more we talk about um, Agile, the more we are really talking about Agile DevOps, meaning developers need to do more of the operational task. So operations is being shifted left. Now, that's all well and good, but in order to do that, we have to get developers, uh, the production teams, to trust developers more. We have to do more automation. We have to have more transparency. Because without it, what we find is this agile practice becomes a water scrum fall approach, whereby you have this nice little process that's running across. But when it gets to the production level, it gets to the staging, the staging area, and that's where it turns back into waterfall. So continuous it builds running. Perfect. Continuous integration, great. We're even pushing things off to continuous test. But when it comes to production, they go, no, we're not going to take it. We have our own rhythm. We have our own process. And we need to do it on our own. And why is that? Well, a lot of it has to do with the hidden um, metadata that's in the scripts. 
production teams don't necessarily see the way the developers see things. And generally what happens is those, uh, th those production teams, when they talk to a developer about a script that they've written, they perceive the de developer to look like this guy. And they perceive the scripts to look like that. Because they're not scripters, they're operations people. They're not there to sit down and try to debug somebody's script. So what do you think that they do? Any, 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 any idea what production teams do after they get your code? They script something. <laughs> they write their own script. Now they might be writing their own script with their own tools. They might be trying to use a chef or a puppet to pull the application together and do some sort of a release. But the point being is that we certainly have a trust problem here that's preventing us from really achieving the promise of Agile, which was to get the application out to production, not into a staging area like we used to do in, waterfall, in the waterfall approach. So how do we disrupt that? How do we fix the family dysfunction that's in this process? Um, and disru disruption is going to be key for any of these Agile practices. We have to disrupt the way that we've done things. Developers must do less scripting. They, they must maximize on the not doing. More automation is going to be required. Uh, operations teams, they're going to have to learn to trust the developers. But in order for developers to be trusted, they have to have more transparency, and they have to have uh, more control. They, have, they don't want to lose control over their production environments, but maybe they will you know, create a, a process that's a little more open if they have better transparency. And sometimes it's those scripts that keep the transparency from being real. A script is not transparent. It doesn't generate reports. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't handle uh, solving problems as easily as it should. Now, I add vendors to this list because it's one of my pet peeves. We're a software vendor. We provide tools in this space. We compete with the likes of a CA or an IBM or Microsoft um, or Puppet. We were just in the magic quadrants for the Gartner Analyst um, Application Release Automation Capabilities Report, and we beat out Microsoft and Puppet. <laughs> we're very excited about that. Uh, but these vendors see these operational tools as legacy systems. And when I say legacy systems, I'm talking about spend a million dollars, install it all on your, op your production machines, and have all of your development teams use the same tool. It takes them a year to come up with a, a, a process to even buy it. They got to go through budgeting. They have to get everybody on board. Then they go through a proof of concept. And then they sit around and pick their nose for a while and figuring out if they, this is really what they want to do because they're so afraid of, of, of having technical debt and purchasing something that's high risk. So they charge a lot for it. But that's not how we're doing in Agile. That's not the whole. That's not how we're doing work. In Agile, project teams are doing the, the operational work, which means they're not really going to wait for the IT side of the house, the data center side of the house, to decide on a deployment solution to use. And they don't have a million dollar budget or even a two hundred fifty thousand dollar budget to install the software onto two hundred servers. So there's a. It's broken, and the vendors have to fix that. And you know we're doing everything we can to disrupt that ourselves. So for uh, again, I stole this from CloudBeast because I thought it was kind of a nice um, uh, description of where we are today for most of us. I, you notice in here that most people are doing team level agile and team level CD. So that is continuous build is is one. And continuous integration it really is two. Because I guess you could say two goes up to continuous test because it's got the delivery practice. Enterprise Agile is what they're talking about is everybody is doing Agile in the company. And Enterprise CD is really how many people are using a continuous delivery process that actually pushes code to production and doesn't rely on production to pull it when they're ready. So it's a push or pull when it gets to production. And what we want to get to is a push to production, constantly pushing new features to production. So um, Gartner claims that uh, 
Application release automation uh, will be the heartbeat of the overall DevOps strategy for most data center organizations. Notice he says for most data center organizations, you know how irritated I get when I see that. <laughs> it really should be. I get it from what they're saying because ARA is being sold to the data center. It's not being provided down to the developer. And that's where the developers need to dig in with this stuff, not necessarily the data centers. Because what is Agile DevOps? It's the process of pushing more operational uh, responsibility down to the development teams. And as we're being chased by containerized data centers, microservices, we are going to f uh, see a day that the operation departments, they don't want to manage that stuff. They may want to use some of the high-level tools to manage the environments, but they will not want to have to manage all those containers. They are going to make a shift themselves. But unfortunately, most of the big companies are still selling in that legacy model, holding back uh, the process of doing what the, cl the cloud beast calls this unicorn of continuous deployment. So how do we make that jump? Got to go back to those three principles, maximizing on the work not done, establishing that con con uh, continuous feedback loop, Trust but verify the developer's work. So I added the verify, because the only way you can trust is if you can see what happened, right? So just trusting the developers is enough. You have to verify what the developers are doing, or I should say the developers need to provide a way for people downstream from that pipeline to verify the work that they've done in order for them to be more part of that conversation. It's more of a, it becomes more of a, a collaboration. So self-service is really what we are, are ultimately talking about. We're talking about the ability for developers to do more work, for testing to be able to have things happening in a more automatic way, for them to initiate work and take more responsibility, and for production teams, believe it or not, to do less. Production teams don't want to do as much work. Now, generally what production teams do is manage infrastructure. They don't necessarily manage application code. Their focus is on the um, infrastructure. What version of Oracle? What version of the operating system? What version of you know, the Java runtime should be on, installed in every single uh, endpoint? So what application release automation and infrastructure as code pra practices really equates to is continuous deployment. By putting, you have to put those two pieces together in order to make it fully work. And you know what? You got to do it without scripting. It's time that we stop the scripting madness. This is 2017. And we're still scripting the same way as we scripted in the waterfall practice. In fact, the stuff that you stick underneath your continuous delivery process or your CI workflow, those are the same scripts you were using at, work, at the waterfall level. You've maybe cleaned some up, and the build scripts, I know, they're hard to still fix. So it's, you know, I, I blame a lot on the scripting, the scripting process because it is the, the detour that we're taking. Instead of getting our hands on operational tools that really do automate the process of continuous delivery to, I should say, continuous deployment to the development, repeated at test and repeated at production, we keep going back to what we felt was comfortable. You know, it was, that was our, our, um, our comfort level is to do things in a scripted manner, so what ends up happening is that we detour around using the scripts. Um, there's a lot to be said about not um, using scripts and why people are using this detour. And like I said, one of the first one is most, comp most development teams don't want one tool for everybody. One ring to rule them all isn't necessarily what we need to do. We need to throw that ring into <laughs> this pits of mortar. Um, cost. The automation solutions are oftentimes priced beyond what a single project team can do. If you look at the tools that are offered by the likes of CA or IBM, or even some of the high-funded high companies like Zabio or Electric Cloud, um, they're, high, they're, they're legacy tools. They're not sold to the development teams. And development teams can't afford to do it, so they've got to take the detour. It's the only other option they have. And for the most part, Continuous deployment, continuous delivery, ARA is implemented and done by operations and does not include the development teams. The development teams just go, we're gonna just write our scripts, you guys do what you want, we just have to figure out a way to get it in dev and test, you guys fight with the rest. 
So these are two core pieces of the um, of Agile that is starting to become more uh, prevalent and that's being talked about more, and that is application release automation. It's a terrible, terrible name for this space, uh, and and what I call infrastructure as code. So the difference would be ARA focuses on application code, infrastructure focuses on the infrastructure is code, right? And, but they're really both kind of the same. Um, maybe on the infrastructure side, you're going to have a more of a RPM that you get from the vendor that you can just throw out there. Um, or you're going to have more uh, elegant ways of managing it with Chef and Puppet or Nan Ansible. But the point is that is sort of being addressed. What's not being addressed is the, is the application side and being able to take all the application components together with the infrastructure and create versions of that in the same way as we version our source code. So being able to do version deployment instead of, I should let's say we do deployment versioning the same way we do source code versioning. And that allows a lot of, of uh, uh, flexibility and agility because it allows you to roll back, to roll forward, jump versions. Development could be at version five. Production could be version one. Development wants to production to jump versions. It can do that easily because you're taking both the infrastructure components, all of those low-level details, bundling them up with the application, and you're versioning all that information. That is the ultimate in being able to say you you really are versioning the operations. You're uh, treating operations as code. Now, what you really find, what we're really trying to get to is a, a, a th that last topic we, we addressed. You know, automation, thinking about scripting in a different way, maybe minimizing on doing some of that scripting, and look for ways to improve um, automation by using actual automation tools. We talked about being able to trust developers. And the easiest way to trust developers, of course, is for everybody to be able to verify what the developers did. And then the last thing is the time to reflect, the, the continuous feedback loop. It, it is probably, that is the holy grail of, of agile development, to be able to look and do as quickly as possible continuous process improvement. And sometimes it, it can be hard to do that when you can't see into the process itself. You can't solve what you can't report because you have no way of knowing there's a problem. So continuous feedback is the luxury of being able to see everything as it moves through the, through the life cycle of the pipeline. You can see what a, a source code update was made. You can see if there was an infrastructure update made. If a Cisco router was updated, when did the, how did it break? Where did, we, where did we fail in our process? That's what a continuous feedback loop delivers. And most any time, we were at uh, Jenkins World not too long ago, and they have now a product called DevOptics that's uh, intended to give you more visibility if you're using uh, uh, the CloudBeast uh, platform. Uh, it's an interesting product. I like reporting, um, and so it's something that you might think about if you're a, a Jenkins user and, Cloud bees is something that you would use. So how do you create the loop? How do you make that continuous feedback work? First, you've got to be able to figure out how to package your application code with your infrastructure code. Um, you have to be able to track application versions what we, to what we call a component version. And you have to be able to do some level of push and pull to, uh, the, the ability for development teams to push and production teams to pull if that's what they want to do to any amount of in targets and any any type of environment um, like Craig was talking about his hybrid uh, the, the ability to have a hybrid environment where you might be using AWS you might have physical servers uh, you might have you, you know VMs sitting around still you have to be able to support the, that that broad range of what the analysts often call a bimodal data center where you're using all types of, uh, of different physical servers Now, trusting, but ver trusting and verify, it's all about ta talking. And that's why in the Agile practice they have daily stand-ups. But who is not in those daily stand-ups? The operations team. They would not even think about going to a daily stand-up. They wouldn't even know what this meant. They are? Good, good job. 
And it's going to shift that way. You're going to see more and more operation people show up in those, in those stand-ups. And what's going to happen is those operation people are going to become part of the application team. So instead of being in the operations, they are an operations person that is part of the application team. That's what I mean. We're shifting operations farther left. So collaboration is critical. You have to be able to share and coordinate infrastructure dependencies. You have to know when the production team wants to put in a new version of Oracle if you're a team using it. You have to be able to simplify approval so that the, the, uh, the production team, if they're sitting there doing an approval, they have the information that they need to just make that decision. And you have to add control where required. If, if the production team wants to be able to have tighter control over their environment, you have to have a way to collaborate that information. You have to be able to he hear the production team to say, we need to shut down uh, any releases coming out because we're going to do, do some major changes and we don't want any application code updates. Um, you have to expose and reuse uh, what we call um, installation actions so that production knows what's happening when that software isn't installed. And of course, you've got to be able to define a blueprint of what the application looks like and how it looks when it's going out and really make it easier, much easier to monitor progress, you know, failures and restarts. Uh, these are all going to be critical as we push towards an agile DevOps practice. Now, again, I think most of us are doing pretty good at understanding the importance of doing small incremental changes and taking those small incremental changes across the pipeline. We understand the concepts, but in, in many cases, the concepts are, are, are all that is there because our culture has to change. Once our culture changes, we have to change the, the processes, and the processes will require more maximizing on what's not done. And there's some really great collaboration tools out there that will help support all of this. Um, every tool that, that is on the market anymore it, it improves collaboration between development and uh, or d d you know dispersed teams, regardless of a team's in India and one team's in, in Dallas and another team's on the West Coast. Uh, they need to be better incorporated and better utilized. And tools that are doing automation have to be able to provide you some level of collaboration without talking. <laughs> because it's not always the case where you're going to have the production team sitting next to you. So we, um, about uh, in March, we offered now a open source uh, solution that Steve's going to uh, show around continuous deployments. And we're really excited to be able to say that New Mexico is the champion of continuous deployments on the open source front, because nobody's done it. We're a small company, and we said, you know what? We should just do this. Why not? You know, we have a great product, but it needs to be in the hands of the developers. And developers need to do, be able to have the ability to do more and not spend a quarter of a million dollars because they have, you know, 200 servers that they're going out to at the end of the, of the pipeline. So if you think about what the continuous delivery pipeline looks like, you have, you know, issue tracking is, is open source. We got version control that can be done open source. We have CI and C, uh, continuous build and continuous integration open source. We even have continuous tests as open source. Well, now we have continuous deployment. So if any of you would like to join the community and be part of New Mexico's uh, continuous deployment uh, uh, open source community, please go to deployhub.org and join the community. It will, you know, the product itself is pretty hardened. The areas that we will need um, help on from the community are all of what we call the actions and think of them as plugins. So for example, Ansible, we, um, we use pretty heavily inside the tool. And when you start up uh, Deploy Hub, it sucks in all the Ansible Galaxy roles so that if you wanted to do a Tomcat release, it's already there. Those are the kinds of, uh, of um, act what we call actions and procedures that we'll be looking uh, forward to as the, as the community grows. And you know, we, we, you know, we always, uh, we eat our own dog food, and if we're saying if other vendors need to be more um, cost aware of these types of tools, um, we did it ourselves. So right now, we have uh, our, is, our products is, is uh, on premise, uh, the pro version, which handles what I would call release management uh, kinds of uh, things that we're really not going to get into talking about. Um, 
because most an enterprise would want to have a release train, and that's basically what a, a, the the pro does. But it's only six k for ten applications, and we are offering a SaaS model in the end of the at the end of the uh, October month of October. Before Halloween, we hope to have the SaaS model available. We're just finishing with testing it, um, and it's pretty cheap—25 bucks a month per application to, support, to provide support around the uh, the OSS version, 80 bucks a month for an application. Unlimited users, unlimited um, endpoints. Um, we have gotten some mar market recognition over the years. We were listed as DevOps. Uh, uh, by SD Times as leaders and visionaries in DevOps. Uh, Gartner has uh, published about us two, two years running. Uh, this year we were excited to say that they uh, basically uh, said that we're really good for Jenkins and Ansible. They finally recognized that that's the market we're, we're really approaching, is the continuous delivery, it's the developers. And that we are a low-priced alternative to ARA product, and I didn't put it up there, but we're really excited that we beat out Puppet and <laughs> we beat out Microsoft. That's a big thing. It really is. So just to kind of circle back how ARA in particular addresses this Agile manifesto. Um, first of all, it facilitates the model-driven deployments so that we can address pack build, package, and deploy, basically. Um, and it maximizes on the work not done because what you're doing is is eliminating a lot of the the, the deployment scripts that uh, your some unsung hero in your group is working very very hard to do, and they're not fun. They're not fun scripts to manage. It creates a continuous feedback loop because what you can do once you're managing the deployments tightly, you know where you put something. You know, it's like losing your keys. Where, where, where did that end up? So a continuous feedback loop said, yes, we sent it out to 500 endpoints running in AWS. Um, and it provides transparency, because in order to have developers be trusted by production teams is you have to be able to verify. And the only way you verify is through transparency. So in, what we're really uh, moving towards in, in the ARA space that you hear people talking about and continuous deployment, which is talked about, is the ability for that build, package, and deploy step to be more automated, more model-driven, and less scripted. And when that happens, you can then have a deployment process that adapts to the different mixed environments that it's going to. So you've got dev sitting out there with two machines, a, a single database server, and maybe a, a load balancer. You got test that doubles that, and you got production that quadruples that or even higher. And so at the end of the day, you have a process that you can actually promote and do continuous delivery and continuous deployment every time you do a release. And we all then could have a slide that says we do 12,000, we've done 12,000 releases since, <laughs> since <laughs> the first of the year, and that was only in development. Because ultimately, that's what we want to get to. You don't have, one, one, one small change can be a release candidate. So I'm going to have um, Steve show you what Blue, uh, Jenkins has a product called Blue Ocean, um, that much of their new features are um, in terms of the cloud beast stuff that they're building around, uh, and then how Deploy Hub fits underneath that, so you can see what a continuous delivery pipeline actually looks like when it's running this stuff. Sorry, yes. Sorry, quick question. Um, so you and um, my team, for example, has, has re-architected and built out um, environments like this from a DevOps perspective. So we, I would love to do more of like a POC model to see how this, your component maybe fits in. Would you suggest the twenty-five? Or do you guys do Just download the open source okay. um, and start working with it. Um, if you do, the, it, the easiest thing to use for the download is the Linux. I would put it on a Linux server. Um, there is a container version of it on the Red Hat container catalog. So it's certified. It's a certified container now. Uh, so you can download a Docker container. If you have a Docker, Docker host, you can just run it through your Docker host. Okay. So that looks really... Yeah. You can shrink it. So we only have about uh, 10 minutes left. We'll go just over some uh, high level results here. Um, and we'll see if the SSA. It's been funky. So 
Um, well, like Tracy is saying, one of the things uh, we have is we've taken together uh, infrastructure. So the Tomcat web app runner is the infrastructure layer and our uptime is our application layer. So we're actually creating a blueprint uh, and what we're looking at here is the Deploy Hub uh, open source. Uh, and then we have Jenkins in the background here. Uh, this is part of the Jenkins pipeline. And we'll actually look at one of the past uh, runs here of what Jenkins provides. Um, when we talk about pipeline, it's going to be the, the individual steps. Um, so this is pulling from a Git repo. Uh, we do some integra integration uh, that first level that Tracy was talking about, pulling together the uh, steps of the code. Uh, here we actually went and pulled together uh, what was going to be deployed, and then we actually went off and did ran our, our test cases down here. So we can actually uh, do the deployment of the package uh, of what was part of the infrastructure as well as the application, do the, the test cases, and if all the test cases uh, pass successfully, then we automatically move to the next stage of the pipeline. Uh, then we go up to testing, uh, repeat that process. If everything looks good, uh, we go out to production uh, with our, our changes. Now this is going to be done on every single change. You know, when, we're, when we do our check-in, uh, we go through and, and we do our, our development. We say, development looks good. Let's go ahead and kick off this pipeline now. So the whole goal is to make that automation without any uh, underlying script changes. The end result of what we're able to see, let me actually pull up an old uh, uh, previous one here. We'll see if I can get this to zoom in is to be able to see the feedback loop. Let me load this. It's a little bit slow over the SSH. Scroll this for you guys. And what we're able to see is, is the source code change, the actual files that were changed as part of this uh, deployment process. Uh, these are git commits. So from there, we know a link between what developer changed what code, uh, what build it went into. So that CI, CD, um, this, the CI process of creating the binary. So this commit uh, created build 55. And then that went into a specific component. And that component went out to which servers. So in this case, uh, we had component version, it looks like six. Uh, that went out to our endpoints. In this case, we have uh, about 14 endpoints that we uh, targeted. So you can see how uh, complex a deployment can become very, and this is a very simple example. Uh, if we actually look at the, the application, that's it. And all that, if we look at production, um, you know, we have different versions of that in production. But the end result was, uh, you know, we have many components, who did what, when, where, uh, and how to track all that. And that's what's needed in order to make this process uh, for Agile DevOps visible, transparent uh, throughout, the, throughout the whole pipeline. Uh, one of the things when we were out at Jenkins World, uh, Jez Humble was doing a talk and he said that 70% uh, of the operations people are no longer going to be there. So operations is going to shrink by 70%. What does that mean? Where are they going? Some of them actually are going to uh, be laid off. Um, most of them are going to be uh, consumed by the development side. So they're going to be actually moving operations people into development uh, because of the, the, these types of, of needs uh, to pull together not only what an application team needs, but also the underlying infrastructure, the under, underlying uh, database configurations, all that is going to be pushed down into the development uh, side. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to lose, you're going to have 70% of people lose their jobs. Uh, it means that they're actually going to hire more people. Because uh, you can't have a, a, an operations person spanning 50 teams or 100 teams. They're going to be maybe responsible for three or four teams now in development. So development uh, is going to actually hire more operations people. 
Uh, the remaining 30% are going to be dealing with um, operations types of uh, jobs or roles like uh, network administration, you know, dealing with routers, uh, that type of thing. Security uh, is going to be still remaining over there, but most of the, the DevOps practice, the Agile DevOps, is going to be pushed left into the development world. With that, do we have any questions? Why don't you come back up, Tracy, and we'll... We got like, okay, anybody have a question about anything we talked about today? All right, we'll keep going here. <laughs> so one of the things that um, we'll actually kick off a, a, a deployment process here. Uh, like Tracy was saying, one of the things that we want to do is uh, keep track of who did what and when. Uh, one of the things I have is all the history of what's happened with my application here. So you can see at the bottom, version 9, uh, which is our, our gray version that we have running in development. Uh, it hasn't been approved. Uh, and we'll go ahead and, and make that change to go ahead and deploy that out to production. I'm going to go ahead and, and approve this. And these approvals are being tracked inside of GitHub. Uh, GitHub's the repo that we're actually using as part of this process. Uh, so we can, we can make and keep track of every single thing that anybody does. Uh, it's all versioned. Uh, it gives a nice uh, audit history of, of what's happening. So what we'll see here in a few moments is if I go back, a couple screens. We'll see a new job come up in, in here that will, will show our pipeline running. One of the things that, um, that Jenkins does is, is monitor the repositories for changes. Um, one of the bummers is it can only go down to one minute increments. It, it, it doesn't want to do it faster. So uh, we'll have to wait here for one minute, see if we have time. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the approvals um, can be done through like Slack or HipChat where you, you send in um, an approval uh, to a bot basically and that bot's going to reply back and say, okay, I recorded your history. Um, that's one of the other trends we see is a lot of um, stuff. Ah, we got it running. We'll go, we'll go into it here. And, and you'll see through the, the pipeline here. So um, right now we're... we're Move to testing and production. It's about three minutes. Um, so. And that's one of the things, if we go back to, while wow, this is running, uh, if we actually go back to the, the project here, uh, the Jenkins file is how um, one of the things that is controlling the pipeline. Uh, so the, the pipeline is being treated as code. The deploy, the deploy file is one of ours, and this is how we're treating deployments as code. Um, the trend that we're seeing is everything's going to be treated as, as code and versioned. So your deployment of definitions will be treated as code. Um, your pipeline, your approvals, all that is going to be treated as code and versioned. So what that means is uh, a lot of the UIs are going away. You know, what you see is going to be people going into files, um, making some, and the files are, are, are much simpler than they used to be. Uh, with the invention of YAML and a lot of uh, uh, tools adapting YAML as the, the standard. It's actually editable and human readable versus like a JSON um, or some proprietary um, language that somebody made up. Uh, and that's where we're seeing as that's, that's coming through that, that process. So if we actually go out to our timeline. All right, so we've done integration. If we look at integration here and I just go ahead and refresh. 
we've moved to uh, gray. So we're actually uh, chugging through our process here. We'll see if it's made it to testing. And eventually production here will get updated. It hasn't gotten there yet. But the whole, the whole, the whole key is to give that, that whole deep dive and traceability from what a developer's done, uh, how that is associated to uh, a feature request or a sprint, uh, how that sprint's being aggregated together with other teams. Um, that's all packaged together and then automatically starts rolling through the pipeline um, process with automatic approvals, um, with, with the hands off. And this is done where we don't have developers going in and, and changing scripts on, on Friday night. Um, I used to be, I used to do builds for Discover Card. And the favorite thing Friday night when all the developers going out to the bars, here's the build. And midnight comes around and you're calling, you're paging people out and saying, well, you know what, your build doesn't work. And we can't get your deployment to work. Come back in. So dealing with uh, developers that have been at the bars for four hours on a Friday night does make it interesting. <laughs> and that's, you know, in, in people that you, know, you want to eliminate that. You know, you want to make, make it a, a seamless process that you can do. Um, why, why can't we do a deployment? You know, Wednesday, Wednesday at, well, that too. Well, it really, really you want to be able to do a deployment at, you know, Wednesday at, at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> that's, why, that's why they invented Slack in HipChat. Yeah. So, well, the way, the way they solved it was they, they said, okay, everybody go home Friday night. We'll have India pick it up because it's the morning for them and let them deal with it. You know, so they, they just did the 24-hour development cycle and passed the buck to somebody else to deal with. So I think we're about out of time I th uh, right around there. Any other questions, comments? Of course. Yep. Yeah, that's, uh, this is uh, our initial. Uh, <laughs> you know, what we're seeing here is the open source as well as Jenkins, which is the open source. Um, you can see our production finished here. If we re refresh production, we're back to gray. So, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, neat things we want to do. Um, drill downs, all that fun stuff. Uh, that interactive pieces. Um, so come out, uh, join the deployhub.org uh, project. Uh, this is open source uh, and it's available for anybody to uh, go ahead and download. And if anybody wants any of the cute Jenkins little uh, alien guys stickers, I have some in my bag somewhere. So thank you everybody.